Mr. Wozniak, uh, may you have a couple of words regarding this uh, conference, regarding this event? What can you say to us? I'm honored to be in a place that I've never been from, and I'm sure that I have ancestors going back to Ukraine. Um, it's quite an honor to be in one of the impressive, this impressive airplane largest in the world. Things like that catch attention. Why do we keep trying to push the boundaries and do things more than they have been done before and see where it takes it? It often involves a lot of risk. Will something new work or will it not? But it's what pushes us. Those of us that are trying to discover um, new, new products, new ways of life, new ways of technology, new information. We're trying to discover new things. It's like science. And you're always trying to go beyond where you were before. And uh, certainly the size of this facility represents that. Um, I, When I grew up, we didn't really have computers in personal life. And you know, some companies had computers. They were slight, big networks. They were huge mainframes. They cost so much money that no person thought they'd ever be near a computer. But there was a possibility. Technology comes from the bottom up. Studying atoms, studying chemistry, studying physics, and you create the ability to have new products that can change the way life is. I was not driven by wanting to make computers for people. It was more, what would the computers do for the people? You have to always think of, how is some new improvement in technology going to improve life? And I always like to think of the average common people. In my case, it was, if we ever had our own computers, we might have the ability to communicate very fast with a lot more people. We might have better education. I value education very highly. I was a teacher in public schools for eight years of my life. No press allowed because um, I had reasons. And I also, and also the little geek like me who studied technology and learned how to use it and write software and design hardware. The little geek, we were called geeks, would be um, very important when we went back to work in our companies. We would sit down with our own computers and write our own programs and not have to rely on everything the rich company has. So it was like elevating the common person to have the power that they could achieve through their own brain. And I'm honored to be here and um, glad to be part of this discussion. Radio Free Liberty, uh, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, Maria Buchenko, good morning, Mr. Wozniak. Uh, so my question, um, uh, cyber attacks are not uh, something supernational nowadays, yeah? And, uh, but their consequences are getting worse and worse in Ukraine. Um, for instance, uh, the infrastructure of Ukrainian government was attacked, uh, was hit by a virus known as uh, PETA recently, yeah? And it was uh, a great uh, problem for Ukraine. Um, considering, um, so my question is, uh, considering econo economic state of Ukraine, what, is the mo uh, what are the most important steps Ukraine should take to uh, protect uh, its cyber uh, space? And to your mind, uh, how much time uh, can they take and uh, how, much, uh, how expensive their implementations can be for Ukraine? Well, the first thing to understand is, are cybersecurity penetrations hurting the economy of the country? And how are they hurting it? And then formulate responses based on that. I can't give one general clue. There is not a technological way to prevent hacking, to prevent cybercrime. Some of it is done by people who manipulate networks in operating systems, get in to workplaces they shouldn't be. Some of it's done just by asking questions and getting passwords of important people. Imagine a high up person in a company, in a country, a high up person, and if their password gets discovered, they have access to all the data anyway. So it's very difficult to protect against that. Um, I mean, uh, you'll have to talk to a lot of people other than myself. I'm just an engineer. You know, I'm, I'm always hoping, hoping that we'll have operating systems, even processors in the future that have built-in security from the bottom down, but you'll never protect the security of just humans in the social world. So it, it's, it's just a problem that we've got to learn to live with. One of the things is you can distribute things um, 
to where they're they're spread out and not all centralized. Central control means there's ways to hit a central control and maybe knock out the power to an entire country because the computer with the directive is all there in one place. So to put things in multiple places is, is better for security. As far as uh, economy, I don't think cybersecurity is necessarily a big threat to um, to the economy. The economy is just is a lot of other things in life, you know, deciding to work forward and work to improve things, improve the standard of living and move the country forward. And you know what? One of the best things of all is to forget the problems you have and, and, and throwing out a lot of blame and just saying, well, how can we decide to move forward? What's the best? Maybe it's to be friends with people that we almost portray as enemies. Our project is about white cross hackers and uh, we are about to uh, start a company which will be an uh, international bug bounty platform for the white hat hackers. So uh, this is very important for us, you know, for the cyber security and for Ukraine because it will, it will be based here but it will be international. People from all around the world will work on it. We brought uh, 30 best white hats and uh, we, when we started to uh, enter in Google uh, white hat hackers, one of the articles was that uh, you are a white, uh, white hat hacker and you used to hack the telecommunication systems. And this, that's a lie. Oh, okay, yes, yes. Yeah. I, I never hacked a computer like, uh, get, like people talk about that. No, but telecommunication is the truth. Um, I, had, I was in college, a young person, and I discovered something amazing. My entire life, I have pursued amazing things, interesting things, interesting people, the sorts of things they would make movies out of, the sort of people that they would have in movies. And I try to follow these things. And I discovered, unexpectedly, let me think, um, 1970? That's a long time ago. That if you put tones, beep, 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 like musical tones, into an American phone, you could make phone calls anywhere in the world for free. And it was really funny. This was called a blue box, and I built one. And I used it, and my friend Steve Jobs said, let's sell it, and we actually sold some. And it was so interesting. I loved showing it off. I was a shy person, socially not inclined. But I loved coming out and blossoming and showing, talking about all the things these devices could do and how the networks worked and to make free phone calls. I did not make, make phone calls to save money. I will point out one interesting thing. I have many, many, many stories and stories and stories of interesting times with these little devices that could do something sort of like hacking, using the system in a way that it was not intended to. But one of them was, you, in those days, you could make no phone calls from the United States to Russia. I forget if it was country code 7 or 8, it was one of those. You could not make a phone call to that country. And as much as I tried with the blue box, I could never get through it one time. I don't know why. I actually got someone speaking Russian. So maybe maybe I got through to an operator there. I kept trying. Can artificial intelligence, uh, intelligence help in uh, cyber defense? Oh, well, yeah. obviously the answer is yes, because we see so many examples of not artificial intelligence. I don't like the phrase. It is misused. It sort of implies something that thinks like a human brain. We're not there. We can sort of simulate the brain in some areas, just like a machine that can play chess. It's just a lot of formulas repeated millions of times a second, and it can seem to be intelligence. So um, as far as cybercrime, what we do have, though, is modern technology of learning machines. Neural networks have been expanded and studied in software written that can study a goal. Maybe the goal is to be a video game. To take all the inputs in, trying to get certain outputs, and correlate them, let the machine try every option, and the machines learn become better than humans in a short time. And we all read about this. And obviously, for things like cybercrime, what you want to do is train machines to look for unusual activity. To best you, activity uh, that doesn't seem to be in normal and, and productive. Oh, sorry. Uh -huh. So, what you, I, uh, yes, so I came everywhere except them. Alrighty. Anyway, learning machines, they learn to do tasks very well. They study inputs 
inputs and inputs and inputs and figure out a way to get them to correlate. Take the actions that will take you to the proper uh, solution. And cybersecurity is a lot like that because you say, if some action, uh, computers are set up to be accessible from all over the world and doing a lot of things for a lot of people. How do you determine which ones are cyber activities? They have strange, they have unique characteristics that you could actually train an artificial intelligence to look for them and say this was this was a hacking attempt. This was a cyber cybersecurity flaw. Which ones are? And eventually the machine will learn to very quickly identify what might be threats and what is normal activity. That's the theory. But the trouble is every time you make something more secure, the hackers learn ways to get around it. So you have to, you know, is it studyable, is it escapable, can I trick the machine? You're, you know, we're always going to deal with that. We're never going to stop hacking. Hello, my name is uh, Elizabeth. I'm from uh, between. Uh, I'd like to ask um, uh, the reason opinion that um, uh, uh, Russian hackers uh, uh, have influenced on the results of uh, presidential election in the USA. Uh, do you think that uh, it's uh, true and uh, how Ukraine should be should protect their elections? In, uh... yeah, I, I, I believe it is true that the Russians have done that. I believe that they try to do it all over the world. There are many other examples because all of our intelligence agencies agree on that fact. Um, trying to get involved in elections of other countries, we sort of have this idea that what we are about is especially in the, um, you know, in the, the side of the world where we have voting, that, oh, we can always, you know, we pick the, uh, the best president that we want, but it can be interfered with. For example, what, what the Russians did could give people, you know, oh my God, negative impressions, oh my gosh, I don't like this candidate, I'm gonna vote against them. Uh, this, Actually having an effect in an election is a bad thing by our principles of, you know, what we stand for in the United States, our democratic principles. So, I, I you know, I think that's just a, it's a, it's a bad, it's just a bad thing. And I don't know, I'm surprised. The problem is people will fall for it. People can always be tricked and fooled and not really, you know, see common sense and think for themselves and then looking for what voting is is part more a game than anything else. So I, so I, I I don't think that was a very good maneuver at all. And I think we should have better relations with Russia and not have them thinking, oh my gosh, they can get in and manipulate us. If you think the way a lot of people say, the next war will be a cyber war, it won't be so much weapons, um, then you gotta say, what position are you in the world? And if another country is manipulating your country, you're behind them. What, like you used to say, we're behind, behind them militarily. Now we're behind them in, in cyberspace, and uh, that's, that has a lot more meaning today.